Well, thank you, Vijay. And I'd like to invite up on stage our first uh, guest of the morning, um, Reid Hoffman, uh, the co-founder of LinkedIn, and I think one of the most uh, uh, influential thinkers in, in Silicon Valley and in this, uh, the world of tech. Um, Vijay set us a very high standard. I guess we have to be the best opening keynote conversation you've ever heard uh, if we're going to get, uh, get, get off on the right foot to achieve his challenge for the day. Um, but we have just the man for the job. And I, I want to start, Reid, by asking you about this new concept that you've been talking about over the last year or so, blitz scaling. What is that? So if you actually ask most of the intelligent experts within Silicon Valley what the secret of Silicon Valley is, they will give you the same story they were giving you about 20 years ago, which is a land of startups. You have technology, venture capital, technology universities, technology companies, you put them in a pot, you stew, and you have a culture which has a general uh, uh, lack of a fear of failure, and you have lots of shots on goal, and some of those become the unicorns and dragons and other kinds of companies that uh, are transforming industries. And yet that story is necessary, but actually now insufficient. Because actually, in fact, if you were going to take that story and look at at least 20 places in the world, you would actually see unicorns and dragons essentially distributed, roughly indexed by technological population. And the actual real thing is that Silicon Valley has developed, developed a living playbook of essentially how to scale globally uh, very quickly. And I'm calling it blitz scaling because actually, in fact, it has parallels to the kinds of techniques that were invented actually in Blitzkrieg, even though the military metaphor is a little uncomfortable, obviously, which is how do you essentially pare down and move very fast in order to capture large market opportunities? And Uber, of course, uh, is a canonical current example. And the key thing about this is that actually blitz scaling is not necessarily done through operational efficiency. It's done through, this, uh, through being able to move very fast to capture a large opportunity. And so the very attributes that matter to it, like for example, you have to have a big prize. It has to be something where when you get there, uh, actually you can entrench in a pretty good way, because uh, otherwise it isn't worth the massive amount of capital and everything else that goes into it. Frequently in Silicon Valley, we tend to align that with companies that we call, which, which we say have network effects. And then there's a set of techniques about how you grow the organization, uh, how you go product market fit, uh, how you actually go from single threaded to multi threaded, uh, how you bring in new talent at, at fast rates and effectively, how you build the culture of the company. And I taught a class at Stanford on this, um, uh, interviewing a bunch of the people who've done this, like, you know, such as Eric Schmidt and Reed Hastings. Uh, last fall, and the links are online if people are interested. And just, just spell out in the case of Uber, what, what is it that the traditional Silicon Valley narrative doesn't tell us about what Uber's done that's allowed Uber to scale so fast? Well, so for example, the traditional Silicon Valley narrative tends to be the, uh, you invent a piece of technology, and that technology has such market demand, you just kind of hold on to it as it goes. And obviously, there is a lot of market demand for Uber. Uh, probably most of the people, if not all the people, have actually used it. You know, an easy ability to call a car and revolutionize transport is really important. But actually, what's going on behind it was essentially a roadmap for, you know, a playbook for how do we uh, launch a lot of cities quickly? What is the way that we establish a local team? How is it we start validating drivers into it? Um, we need to scale uh, the, the number of different efforts we're doing technologically, everything from self-driving cars to uh, route mapping and everything else. And so, for example, as an example of some of the things that Uber has done in terms of blitz scaling, one thing they do is when they hire an engineer, not always, but uh, frequently, when they hire an engineer that they like, uh, they will say, OK, in your previous company who you were working with, who are the three best engineers? And they will send them offer letters without an interview. Right? That is a blitzscaling technique. Because it's, it's more important to go fast, get big, because of course there will be some cultural things, some people will churn out and everything else. But that will essentially allow you to grow your engineering team at a very fast rate in order to be capturing the, the, the set of things that you need to be doing. And, is it, and this playbook, I mean, is this, this something that's written down, that's there from day one, that you, know, you go to a Y Combinator or whatever, <laughs> and they're going to give you this as part of the training? Or is this something that, you know, with the case of Uber, I mean, at what point in the process did they know they were going to be doing this split screening? Well, so blitzscaling. Blitzscaling. Um, Sorry, the, uh, <laughs> it just feels like blitzscaling in, in many cities yes. where you're in the taxi industry. Uh, I, yes. Uh, um, yes. Uh, and so, uh, essentially, what you do is you begin 
the, the reason you may make a decision to go, to go blitz scaling is you both have to be able to get access to the capital to do it, because it is actually, in fact, an expensive thing. So in a few cases, you can have a revenue engine that's powering it, but frequently you actually need a deep pool of capital, uh, because you're frequently scaling far beyond, far beyond, uh, ex, uh, in expanse of your current actual uh, revenue. Second thing you have to do is you have to say, okay, there's a, it's, a, it's inefficient, so you have to actually have a reason to do it. Uh, the reason could be first to market, the reason could be critical mass scale, the reason could be competitive defensiveness. All of these are good reasons in order to do it. And so, you know, uh, Uber launched, they, uh, usually you want to have very good data that you have good product market fit. Uh, frequently, uh, you know, many of the uh, big flame outs you'll see is you actually haven't really figured out your business model, you haven't really figured out product market fit, you've decided to blitz scale, and that can be, if you can raise the capital for it, that can be the particularly big craters. But, uh, so they say, look, we have co competitive issues, there's essentially uh, transport, you know, people transport like startups going around all over the world. Uh, this is recognized as a really good category. It is city by city. So we have to get to every city very quickly. And so some of the stuff that uh, Travis and the team did very well is they said, okay, it's time to raise a whole bunch of capital and go very fast. And then part of the thing that makes this work within Silicon Valley is a, a, part of, a essential part of what powers Silicon Valley is the network. And it's not just the network of talent, which is really important. You can bring people in who had experience with high-scale companies before or fast-scaling companies before, had experience with the relevant technologies. But there's also a learning network that is composed within Silicon Valley because whether it's venture capitalists, angel investors, experts um, who can say, okay, here is, here is things that you can, uh, you can ignore because uh, part of what's happening when you're blitz scaling is you're actually ignoring problems because you're like, no, 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 actually speed to scale is the thing that matters. And so if we're actually having uh, difficulties with uh, exactly, for example, the tool development of how we are um, going to be deploying our software may be lagging behind, and that will cause frictions, organizational frictions, development frictions, that's okay. Also, uh, what are the key things that you need to do now such that you don't uh, hit, a, hit a wall that you then have to work around, but you can actually continue growing through that? And so you bring in various folks who have solved, it's almost never the same problem, but similar problems in terms of advice around the company. Because when you move from, and part of what we did in our Stanford class is we said, organization scale um, is the thing that powers revenue scale and customer scale. And so how do you essentially effectively move to the organization scales and be, de and be uh, uh, doing a good, um, you know, kind of producing good product and service and operating reasonably effectively while doing that? You don't say, when I move from 10 people to 50 people, I get rid of the 10 people and I hire 50 new people. I'm hiring 40 new people. How do I uh, bring them in effectively? And how do I take the original 10 and how, how do I help them learn th that way? And then 50 to 100 and 100 to 1,000. That's the kind of pattern that's happening within Blitzscaling. I guess Blitzscaling is not a Six Sigma activity in that sense. No. It's, it's, uh, so I mean, I suppose one of the attractions of the um, traditional Silicon Valley narrative about the technology being the magic bullet in a sense and just sort of going of its own accord um, is it does allow for this small scale bootstrapping startup idea to really uh, take off whereas I suppose what you're describing seems like much more of a large scale plan as you say very capital intensive which in a way ought to make it something that traditional large companies and we have many of those represented here you know, ought to be able to to do better than the startups in some way. So what I'm interested how you think about if you're if you're talking to a, a big company that's sort of thinking about innovation and how does it how does it stop Silicon Valley eating its lunch or whatever? Is there are there lessons in blitz scaling for them? I think there are. Um, I think what you want to do is you want to look at there are strengths and weaknesses you have as an existing large company, including when you're an existing large company within Silicon Valley. And you want to try to uh, set the battlefield as much towards your strengths and away from your weaknesses. So if it's simply kind of uh, uh, going to a radical green new field, which has a different business model or a very, very different technological base, you can get there. That's, that's very difficult. And it's difficult to compete with, because usually it's not just competing with one startup. Usually there's 100 startups going at that speed, you know, at that area. And so you may have triple the chance of one of the 100 startups, but that doesn't give you a very good batting average relative to which of you will win that. So the kinds of things I think you think about when 
uh, you're in uh, areas where you may be competing with blitzscaling companies, is to say, okay, what are the ways that I can take my current advantages, and doesn't mean retrench in only what I'm doing, but use them. So one of them is, for example, blitzscaling companies almost always have very short time windows. They have to have quick progress month by month, quarter by quarter. Longer development projects are the th kind of things that uh, can actually, in fact, if you say, look, I'm doing a five-year plan, and it's still going to compound through that and, and do that effectively, that gives you a time window that most startups actually don't operate in. And so if you can lock them into some regulatory battle for the well, eight years, yeah. using that's, your lobbying power, yeah. that's a good that, that wasn't the one I was no, recommending. No, no, obviously. <laughs> I have seen people try to deploy that one. Um, and it usually only delays the inevitable. <laughs> right. So uh, is there an example of a company that has you, you well, used? Well, well let, me use, let, me, let me talk about uh, a Silicon Valley example, which is uh, one of the things that's happening right now is uh, Facebook, uh, was, I put them in order, Google, uh, Facebook, and Microsoft are all uh, working pretty intensely on artificial intelligence technologies. And, uh, and while there are startups that are doing artificial intelligence technologies, the likelihood is these new, t uh, actually the techniques are not hugely new, there's some important new additions, but the application of these techniques with large uh, server farms and large data sets is creating amazing uh, results in terms of self-driving cars, medical diagnosis, a set of different things. This is actually an area where large companies, um, such as uh, uh, Google and Facebook, can actually deploy much more strongly than startups. Right, so like even Facebook would have difficulty going after uh, Uber, Airbnb, because it's a green field, they're going after it. But actually, in fact, building a new AI technology, which will take multiple years in order to refine on the data sets, get the applications right, is a perfect kind of innovation from a large company versus a startup in terms of being able to capture broad new swaths and, and, and be the company of the future. And so when you're looking at uh, other companies, that's the kind of thing to look at is, OK, what's what part of um, uh, that my assets, my position, allows me to develop a longer time frame thing that will actually, in fact, be the kind of company of the future I want? Now, there's one caveat to this that I think is very important, which is I do think software is transforming the world. Uh, my friend Mark Andreessen frequently refers to this as software eating the world. And so I more or less think that any organization that is uh, 100 people or more should actually say, what is my software strategy? And if you don't actually have a software strategy, uh, you should think hard and long about whether or not you need one. Because uh, the innovation clock and what's possible through software uh, becomes more and more of a competitive advantage, whether it's a data advantage, whether it's a, um, a distribution advantage, whether it's, for example, the thing that's interesting about Tesla is not that it's an electric car, but it's a software car. Right? Those kinds of things are the things that you need to think about, and that's usually a new competency which will be difficult as opposed to uh, your existing assets. So you, you mentioned AI. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of questions that come up a lot. I mean, one is, you know, how fast is this going to be adopted in a way that radically changes um, people's workforces so they can either get rid of lots of jobs or greatly increase the productivity of, of other kinds of workers? Um, so I think that... Um, Let's see, usually um, the future is sooner and stranger than you think. So uh, the fact that AI will start being deployed sooner than most people reflexively think, matter of fact, it essentially already is, um, is I think something to really pay attention to. But it doesn't mean that, you know, then what happens is people go, oh, we're going to have robots, <laughs> you know, taking all the jobs five years from now, which is not going to happen. Uh, because? But, well, because actually, in fact, getting robots, like, so, for example, the kind of thing you're already seeing through AI is you can actually have an app on your mobile phone that can diagnose whether or not uh, uh, the skin lesion is cancerous or not uh, better than your average doctor. Uh, that, that's essentially uh, present today in terms of functionality. So you say, all right, well, does that mean that uh, doctors are all going to go away? Not necessarily, because essentially when you look at it, you say, now we have a, uh, a cross-check of a very good way of saying, is this a uh, particular skin thing, something we should be worried about or not, that allows doctors to focus on a lot of other things or have higher touch with their patients and so forth. So it doesn't, doesn't mean that we're going to have all robot doctors because you have this specific thing. That's, that's actually an example of it. And if you actually look at most of these technological developments, they tend to be 
oriented towards how do you amplify productivity from individuals. Now, sometimes that will lead to great job locution because, for example, if you go to self-driving cars and essentially say, okay, now every car is self-driving or the vast majority, then essentially you say, okay, we have a transportation workforce that needs to, tra uh, needs to transfer uh, kind of skills and industries. It's very painful, it's difficult. The Industrial Revolution was painful and difficult. And we need to, as a society and as, as companies, help facilitate that because we would actually, in fact, rather have you know, and kind of everyone engaged and participating in the future. However, uh, that is not, um, that's probably the worst one I can, can see coming in terms of the biggest like you know, digital leap. But uh, I actually think that there's ways that when you, for example, look at uh, tellers when they're brought into the banking system, uh, you had ATMs, that didn't actually reduce the number of tellers. The tellers just started doing different jobs. So it, it kind of, it's an uneven thing that doesn't lead to all the robots are doing all the now, some, some of uh, Some leading technology people like Elon Musk and mm -hmm. Bill Gates have talked about AI as mm -hmm. potentially th posing existential threat to humanity. <laughs> did, did you share that fear? Um, so, uh, let's see, the, the short answer is uh, a truly generalized artificial intelligence will be a new species, and as part of a new species, uh, what our relationship with it will be complicated. Uh, however, I actually think I worry about people who, I, I worry about that one being the primary concern because actually I think it's a set of other things, including the labor translocution, that are the more real present issues uh, for how we should be thinking about uh, both the opportunities and the challenges uh, for artificial intelligence. And so I myself tend to say, don't worry too much about, you know, yes, we've seen this movie, The Terminator. Yes, we've seen this movie, The Matrix. Uh, these are movies. And uh, part of the thing is that an, uh, an AI wouldn't necessarily go, my uh, uh, raison d'etre is to dominate humanity. They may actually have very other kinds of things. Better things to do. Better things to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so the real question is actually, in fact, how we evolve and how we deploy uh, artificial intelligence. And so I'm more worried about what humans will do with it than what prospective future intelligence is. And one other actually point that's actually useful here is part of how I actually calibrate amongst technologists what their views on AI is, is I ask them, for generalized AI, when between 10 and 100 plus years from now do you think that a generalized AI will be created? If they say 10 or 20 or 30, they have some worries about this transformation. And if they say 30 or more, then generally speaking, what they're partially saying is there's enough big jumps that are happening here that it's un it'll happen, but it's unclear when it will happen. And then as you get closer, then you'll actually have a better sense of what the opportunities and challenges are. Now, uh, one other area the way you've been a notable uh, commentator in public has been on uh, the rise of the blockchain, and, mm. which is the, the software underlying uh, Bitcoin. Um, and I guess you're notable in not being an extreme libertarian that wants to bring down the state <laughs> and create a parallel money and so forth. I mean, why, what, what's the most exciting thing to you about the blockchain? So what makes the internet is the internet's an open platform that unlocked a lot of of creativity and many different uh, software development efforts that could create everything from all the world's information at your fingertips to uh, discovering uh, entertainment to you know medicine to transfer uh, to to be, being able to be much more efficient as a individual in your career, such as LinkedIn or companies hiring talent. All all of this stuff became available because of the internet, where the internet was an open set of technologies. However, one of the open set of technologies that doesn't exist is financial applications. Uh, and that's because you know, there's everything from regulatory and risk management and a kind of a, a, a jointly uh, held monopoly from banks. The thing that is uh, interesting about uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain is it creates the first open platform for value systems. So things that uh, touch money and exchange and contracts uh, essentially, you can use blockchain as a platform uh, in order to, to build new kinds of software applications on top of it. And that's the first of that sort. I wrote an article last year in Wired UK on this um, because part of what I wanted to make sure that people saw was it isn't just the, aha, it's a currency that you can't track, which is, by the way, not entirely true. And we can go into the details of that if we have time. I think we're a little short and <laughs> whatnot. But it's actually, in fact, 
the possibility that new uh, that large numbers of new creative entrepreneurial innovators can try to create new things that enable our financial system and our value system to operate in new potentially great ways is the thing that is potentially massively value transforming. And just and briefly, I mean, if it's not going to be Bitcoin replacing the dollar, where do you see the big disruption happening first as a result of this innovation? Well, so big, Bitcoin and blockchain are tied together. There's a fashion amongst banks now to say we love big, uh, blockchain, we don't like Bitcoin. Bitcoin gives you the economic incentive for the distributed ledger, uh, cryptographic ledger that blockchain is. And that platform, by the way, if you think about it, it's like a, uh, an, an, an open spreadsheet um, that people can write to. And that spreadsheet is like the platform because you can think about like models and other kinds of things you're doing. You know, I think it'll be anything from banking in the unbanked world to money transfers uh, to smart contracts. And part of the thing that's interesting is like when you saw the internet starting to go, you wouldn't have necessarily pr uh, predicted Facebook and Netflix, right? At the, in, you know, 1993, 1994, when it started getting commercialized. I think that uh, the, the same thing is, I think we're gonna be surprised by what the interesting applications are. Great, let's take a couple of quick questions from the audience. Anyone want to kick us off? Um, a gentleman right at the front here. The microphone will come to you and um, right at the very oh, front. Can... Why don't you call out There's and I will... There's a microphone uh, there will, um, too. Yeah. 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 Uh, Just say who you are. Robert Tucker, Innovation Resource. Uh, Reese, the, uh, the data that you're mining and harvesting from LinkedIn, mm. uh, how are you uh, selling that or what is that showing you in terms of Right. So the question, the question is, what with with LinkedIn, vast amount of data. What what big trends yeah. are you seeing from that data? Uh, well, we do actually do occasional releases on this. We don't uh, mine data. All the data is data that uh, members give us, um, and for reasons that are helpful to them. But you know, we can see, for example, like which kind of job categories are growing. Uh, we can see which industries are growing in which regions. Uh, we can see which skills are trending up and trending down. We have an index of, of every kind of English language uh, description of a skill. Uh, all of those kinds of things are parts of the data that then we then use to conceptualize applications to help both individuals and corporations essentially adapt into the future. And there's a bunch of different initiatives. We're very short on time here. So if you're curious about this, look at LinkedIn Cities, uh, which is trying to help cities figure out how to essentially uh, progress their workforces and make sure that they're helping their companies be companies of the future. Um, and then there is um, uh, various trends on like which 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 jobs and which skills are in strong growth modes because we try to give those to students and to other folks. Right, is there a sec uh, lady in the middle here? Uh, have we got a microphone? Yeah, yeah I've got a kind of question as well. Sorry, I'm in the back there's, here. There's a hear me. There. Shall I go ahead or shall you? Yeah, just go ask ahead. the question and we'll also take the lady in the middle yeah. and that will be. Sure. Uh, Henry Bellani with Acuity. Reed, thank you for your comments on Blitz scaling. It really harkens back to Web 1.0, and that's what I'm thinking in my mind, right? I'm not a millennial, so I've seen the, the, uh, the Web 1.0 go to Web 2.0. The time so is fairly short, so could you, could you yeah, just go straight to the question? Speed to scale. I think there are lessons to be learned from Web 1.0. What is it that we need to be aware of as we're looking at Blitz scaling today? Well, and so then we'll just, let's take the question from the lady as well, and then we can do, do both. both. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. Um, I think there's a lot Who of. Who are you, please? There's oh, Carolyn Centeno from Formand. Um, there's a lot of conversation around what Silicon Valley can learn, or what uh, big companies can learn from Silicon Valley, right? But I do think there's sort of the flip question as well of what Silicon Valley can learn from mm. large and established companies, especially with blitz scaling and sort of retaining your brand values as well as culture. And I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, first question, um, a lot of the Web.1 Web stuff was essentially the first real, that was the first area where there was a lot of systematic uh, blitz scaling. And so we learned a lot of negative lessons. We learned the negative lessons of uh, have a pretty good sense of what your business model was before you blitz scale. Uh, we had the lesson of uh, make sure that actually, in fact, uh, because you actually have these operational inefficiencies as you're blitz scaling, 
Make sure that the, uh, the market you're heading towards is a very valuable market because it gives you enough to actually, in a sense, correct your business. And so the businesses that actually, in fact, worked in Web 1.0 and persisted were the ones that really did that well, and many others were essentially creators. That's, that's essentially the Web 1.0. Now, the, what Silicon Valley can learn from other businesses, um, it's actually a tricky question. There's obviously a ton of things. It's, uh, we're, we're bad at brands. We're bad at marketing. Um, uh, there's questions of we're all fairly young businesses, so how you sustain uh, is actually, in fact, one of the things that's, that's important. On the other hand, there's this contrast. Um, people tend to want to have all strengths and no weaknesses. And actually, almost every strength that's worth having has corresponding weaknesses. And so Silicon Valley tends to be very good at this kind of disruptive innovation because it's willing to throw everything out and start from the beginning. And so it's very difficult to say, we're going to do that mindset, and we're going to be learning from existing businesses. So in fact, many of the strengths that allow Silicon Valley to operate in particular ways is one of the things that actually, in fact, then makes that actually a challenging thing for most Silicon Valley companies. And it's, it's because of strengths they have. Um, now, frequently, when I'm asked about how do you create a Silicon Valley uh, elsewhere, and what kinds of things you do, you say, well, for example, if I'm trying to do that in New York, I would try to actually orient that more around the financial system or things that where you have these kinds of assets that people can learn from uh, and, and create a unique ecosystem there. If it's a pure independent software system, it should be within the US more done in Silicon Valley. So, so one last question from me, and that is, um, you know, what is the area of innovation that you are mo spending most time wrestling with at the moment? Well, there's two. I'm obviously thinking a lot about artificial intelligence, but I've already talked about that. So the other one I'm thinking a lot about is the intersection of biology and digital. Right? Uh, essentially, uh, genetics is, is moving. Uh, the sequencing of genetics is, is decreasing costs faster than Moore's law. And it's moving to a read-write uh, where you can both read, that's the sequencing, and also write through CRISPR and so forth. And the, uh, the opportunity and, and challenges of this, I think, are more significant than AI. Great. Well, I think you've given the audience uh, uh, lots of food for thought to, to kick off uh, the day. And so, Reid, thank you so much for coming. Thank we could, I think, talk for hours, but unfortunately, yep. the agenda has to go on. So yep. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.